Okay, thank you. Um, the big question for us is, what's different about these um, settings of fragility, conflict, and violence? And again, to emphasize that uh, the point is settings because these countries have pockets of fragility, pockets of conflict, and um, yet also stable um, locations. We've been thinking about sort of five features of the context that make work on accountability more challenging in these contexts. The first one is civic space. And in these contexts that we're looking at, this issue of closing civic space is even more exacerbated because these settings have experienced long periods of violence and repression. And um, they, you have to, when you're working on accountability, account for the fact that uh, of the impact of trauma, um, fear that has been internalized that prevents people from acting. Um, and it's really hard to get citizens to engage in any kind of accountability work. So what, what do actual processes of empowerment and accountability look like um, in these settings? We know that things are happening. So for example, we did some scoping work in the countries that we're looking at. And in Mozambique, we find that um, some of the protest against um, dissatisfaction with state institutions and public service delivery has been happening through cultural expressions. So for example, rap music, or um, uh, street theater. In Egypt, we find that um, accountability protests have been happening despite the issue of reprisal. Uh, in many places, there have been over 1,500 uh, protests around social and economic rights over just in uh, 2016. So what we are uh, saying is that we really need to understand where and how people are mobilizing in these settings given the closing civic space issue and how are they engaging with um, state institutions. The second key feature of some of these settings is that um, when states are weak and fragile and other actors have stepped in to occupy the space, so you have multiple actors that are involved in governance. You have uh, national as well as transnational, state, non-state. You have armed groups, you have religious organizations, private actors, both large and small. So for example, we have Myanmar where uh, you have ethnic um, administrations that are administering various parts of uh, the territory, including providing uh, public services and collecting taxes. This is behavior like state, state-like behavior. So the big question in these settings is, in what, which accountability relationships are we actually attempting to strengthen? And what does that look like in the long run as well as the short run? because there are these multiple actors that are actually involved. The third point I want to make very quickly is that uh, one dimension of this fragmented form of authority is that this, uh, the salience that informal institutions take, uh, faith-based movements, social norms, diaspora communities, power flows are negotiated and through these less visible channels or these more informal channels norms and social relationships become much more important. So for example, we find in Nigeria that the informal institutions matter more to people than formal state structures uh, that are in place. So the question is not just to how do we hold and who do we hold to account, but how do we ch challenge the norms and um, norms that underpin these institutions that might not be inclusive, diverse, or supportive of rights of everybody. So what, how do we uh, deal with this? The fourth key uh, issue I think that comes up in these fra fragile and conflict and violence affected settings is the whole issue of information. We know that information is key to any accountability work, evidence is required. And yet increasingly, even in uh, the more stable mid-income settings, we know that there's problems of credibility of information and evidence. Powerful actors can deny, distort, and use uh, distracting mechanisms to dismiss evidence that's been provided. We see that actually in the, some of these countries that we're looking at, people don't rely on official sources of information. They're relying on informal sources of information. So for example, in Myanmar, people trust rumors more than they trust formal uh, information from state institutions. So how can we actually address this issue of credible information? And then finally, 
uh, as John mentioned very quickly, these settings have a very low levels of trust between people and uh, public institutions. Uh, social contracts have been broken, are partial or incomplete. So, and they work for some groups and not others. So this uh, raises the issue that John mentioned is that what are the outcomes we should be looking for um, rather than looking for endpoint outcomes such as improved service delivery, should we not be looking at uh, outcomes in, uh, in the form of rebuilding trust, creating active citizens through these processes of engagement? And uh, just to point out that obviously these, these sorts of outcomes in themselves are long-term processes. 